This is Clean Radio. Welcome everybody out there listening to Clean Radio. We are a show about addiction, recovery, mental health, and everything in the middle. My co-host with the most is... Uh, you're looking very good tonight, Andrew, i got to tell you. Uh, you look the same. Uh, thanks. <laughs> and uh, you got your Saints jacket on. I'm sorry. I know. I can't believe it. But I'm, I'm a giant. I'm still trying to pretend to be a Saints fan. But by Sunday, once again, I'll be geared up. Okay, there you go. Uh-huh. And uh, but we, it, let's talk about that a little bit. Because how many people... We, you know, we're a show about addiction, dep- sometimes depression. Well, and, it's applying to me today after this horrible but, loss. But how many people have that? Their, su- their football team loses and on Monday. They, you know, the work productivity. That it's proven statistics. If your team loses the next day, yeah, they actually did studies on people yeah. and they took uh, testosterone levels of men before the game was starts and then after the game's over. And the guys whose teams won, their testosterone level goes up, their free testosterone level goes up, and the one whose teams loses, their free testosterone goes down. So you actually become more sexually aroused and more. Uh, reproductive and the whole thing. So right now I'm feeling kind of feminine. And this year I've lost a lot of testosterone because <laughs> I'm a giant fan. Well, so. for years, right? Yeah. You, know, no, you, had, you had one good year there. Couple, I think, no, right? it's two Super two? Bowls. Right. So I had a lot so. of testosterone in two years. Right. And I've been a woman since. Um, <laughs> but let's welcome everybody out there to Clean Radio. Give us a call. The number is 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. We have, one, we have an amazing guest tonight. I'll get to him in one second. But just something I quickly want to talk about. It's all over the news right now, Andrew. And that's the Duck Dynasty. Yeah. And the reason I wanted to talk about that is because uh, I'm all for free speech, and I, I love the show. And But my biggest problem is, uh, you know, the guy, uh, Phil Robertson, he talks about being sober. One of the things is he doesn't drink anymore. He talks about being a philanderer in the past. And uh, now he's a, obviously he's he's somewhat of, ev- of an evangelical to people of, of staying away from alcohol and drugs. And one right. of the things we've noticed for years is that nothing against religion. We're big advocates for people that want to be religious. We are. But, uh, <laughs> well, um, I, I want to be liked. And um, okay. I am actually. And, um but uh, my mother's going to kill me. You, you get me in a lot of trouble with uh, religion. You get and my me mother. in trouble. But um, and one of the things <laughs> I wanted to part talk of our about, job. One of the things <laughs> I wanted to talk about though was that to people out there that it, it you know when we talk about the twelve steps when we talk about AA it's a, mm-hmm. it's a program of attraction not promotion that a lot of people get help because they see the healthy way people are living. Right. And in and in this case it's a little different because who's going to want to go get help from somebody that calls them a sinner? Well, people that like hypocrisy. Um, so you're saying about 13 million people in America. I'd say a little more than that. Um, probably, probably about 240 million. And, uh, okay, that's our Duck Dynasty story. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> if anybody just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. The reason I talk about that is because it's important that people know that in getting sober and for people out there that are in trouble and need help, you know, it's it's love that, you know, it's... Uh, you know, I just find the whole thing kind of sad that, that uh, number one, that everybody in the media gives it so much attention. Like, it's something that really should have just been dumped and not paid attention to and instead of making it this giant political issue. Certainly the, you know, the guy has right to his own opinion. I You know, I think he's a moron. I think most people think he's a moron at this point. And it speaks for itself, you know, and there's so many much more important issues that people should be talking about. Um, like and, clean radio. Well, but also from important people. I mean, the guy from Duck Dynasty, does anybody really care what he... I mean, he's not going to change the world. He's not going to do anything different. I'm more concerned about what people in power and politicians and people that are out there working, making public policy every day and really changing the world. You know, those, those are the people I want to hear from. You know, I'm not Charlie Sheen and some Duck <laughs> Dynasty guy that are not going to do anything for my life. <laughs> and mm. if you just tune in, like I said, you're listening to clean radio. Um we have an amazing guest tonight. Last week we had we had, last week we had one of my sports icons of broadcasting, which was Mr. Pat O'Brien. And as a kid growing up, I mean, some kids wanted to be FBI agents. I wanted to be a sports agent. You were the kid in the candy store last week. Yes, face and it. and again this week. And again I, this week. And this again is this like week. this is your this is your whole this is candy. This month. is your holiday week. This is candy or month. Month. And growing up, all I wanted to do was a huge <laughs> sports fan, and I, I I I would you know read about this man and. Uh, you know, and then in 1998, in 1998, they made a movie about his life, and um, it was a great movie. It's one of the, you know, I mean, people still quote this movie, and uh, it's about 15 years ago, and people are still quoting it. But when I was a kid, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be a sports agent, and uh, I looked up to this man, and I still do. I look up to him even more now than I ever could have then. And with that, let's welcome to the let's welcome to Clean Radio. Back to Clean Radio. Back to Clean Radio. Um, Lee Steinberg. Good evening. <laughs> I wanted that song on. I wanted LL Cool J. Don't call it a comeback. 
And L- L- Cool J has come to a number of our Super Bowl parties. That's ah. pretty, that's I, you know. And did uh, he bring all the lady loving uh, women that he was loving? <laughs> <laughs> No comment. Wow. Um, We're getting dead air. But, uh, (laughs) but, uh, you know, one of the things I want to talk about, because you've been all over recently, you've been, you know, doing newspaper articles for, you know, everybody, you've been doing TV, the U.S., you know, um, NBC all over. And, you know, something I wanted to talk to Andrew about, too. Um, You know, at a certain point in sobriety, you stop talking negatively about yourself. You know, you've done the amends, you've done all the, the, you know, all that stuff. And at a certain point, and, 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 you know, our guest tonight has done that and he's got his career back and he's got his business back. And, uh, I think there's a point, you know, it's like, oh, let's move on. Right. Well, the reason I wanted to be public about it was in the hope that someone might benefit from my experience and someone who's bewildered and absolutely depressed and, and believes that they're alone, uh, with addiction can learn that there is hope and, um, I wish I had gotten that message at an earlier point. So um, I've been public. I've posted my days on Facebook. Yeah. Um, I've been very public about it. Um, not that I had a choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, not that I had a choice because it it ran on uh, AP all around the world. So people in New Zealand knew that I was having an alcohol problem. Um, and. Wow, we're having a lot of fumbling going on here today. <laughs> and, and, but for anybody not, for anybody Sports unfamiliar, no, for, no, no, got it. for yeah. anybody unfamiliar with you, Lee, you 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 were the first super agent. You know, you, you represented Steve Barkowski right out of college, and you know your clients. I mean, the client list. But forget about that. The client list of the amount of charity your clients have given over six hundred million dollars. You have agents today that you know have a billion dollars in contracts. And you, you know, you, you, your clients solely gave six hundred million dollars, and 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 it's amazing. It's really more than that. My dad had two core values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family, and the second was to be a, a agent for change, to make a positive impact in the world, and to help people who couldn't help themselves. So I saw quickly back in 1975 that athletes had a unique role to play as role models and that if they would retrace their roots and go back to the high school community that helped shape them, to the collegiate community, and put down roots, they could show people the quality of their character as well as having a home to go back to. So we've had 150 players who've set up high school scholarship funds. At the collegiate level, it could be Eric Karros and Troy Aikman at UCLA or Edron James at Miami or Steve Young. And at the professional level, I challenge them to find something in their own heart that they would like to tackle and leave legacy for. So we put together foundations in pro cities that had the leading political figures, the uh, business figures, and the community leaders to execute a program. And um, so you have work done in Tampa and Atlanta doing a program called Homes uh, for the Holidays, which moves single women into the first homes that they'll ever own. And city by city, by paying the down payment and then outfitting it with Home Depot. So city by city, we tried to change uh, the quality of life. And the second factor is that athletes can influence behavior and influence attitudes. So when I had Lennox Lewis cut a PSA that said, real men don't hit women, it could do more to deal with domestic violence with rebellious adolescents than a thousand authority figures would. Those, especially teenagers, tune out right. all those messages. So an athlete can permeate the perceptual screen that someone does uh, against that. So Steve Young and Oscar J. Loya, prejudice is foul play. So there's still a lot of issues to work on, which is part of the reason I came back. Which is, which is something very interesting. By the way, if you just tuned in, you're listening to Clean Radio. That's Lee Steinberg. Um, Andrew, so here's a very – because we talk about this a lot. And, Lee, this is something, you know, every year the NFL, it's beautiful. They have one month out of the year that deals with breast cancer awareness, you know, where they wear, where they wear pink. 
Brandon Marshall, you know, you know, the receiver for the for the for the Chicago Bears wears yellow cleats for mental health. The NFL finds him. They find 15, him. Right. They find him fifteen thousand dollars. And what is it that what is it going to take for mental health to be looked at? You know, to un, to destigmatize. Well, also it. that mental health is viewed as a disease, a right. physical disease, and not just some sort of failure of your morality or your moral development. I think that. There are a whole group of people who think that all action is purposeful. So if you just worked harder, if you simply tried harder, then you would not have a problem with addiction. And uh, that, in essence, the people are, are weak. And once you say that someone is weak and it's a, a character flaw, then it stops from having to deal with the issue of the disease factor and the lack of control over it. So, and then it allows people to be thrown in jail and to not get help or rehabilitation. Well, that's really what we've seen is we've seen the criminalization of uh, addiction and mental illness. And as we've deinstitutionalized and gotten rid of state hospitals, now we see that whole population. I mean, we've had a 90% decrease in state-run mental health beds since 1985. When Governor Reagan was governor in California, who you weren't a big fan of. <laughs> well, I read that. <laughs> I was student body president of Berkeley when he was the governor, and so we used to duke it out. Matter of fact, there was one time he wanted to fire the chancellor while I was student body president because we moved off campus during Kent State and, and Nixon's uh, incursion into Cambodia. So we get in front of the Board of Regents, and he looks across at me, and he says, weren't you the same Mr. Steinberg that was sitting in front of troop trains and got arrested in 1960? So I said, well, Governor, in 1960, I was close to 10, closer to playing with toy trains than <laughs> troop trains, but that shows your usual adherence to accuracy and fact. <laughs> and then it got going. But actually, um. when, when late, 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 ironically enough, later he gave me a couple commendations for community service, and, and uh, I got interviewed. Well, that was just to steal the rewards from you narcissistically so he could own them. <laughs> <laughs> just to put you down and then take all your credit later. And if you just tuned in, you're listening to Clean Radio, give us a call. The number is 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. You can also go follow us on facebook go to facebook.com slash clean radio um we have you know i posted this week tons of questions you know and the you know I, you you have like some amazing quotes um i'll read one of the funny ones but uh the super bowl is like a movie and the quarterback is the leading man and um but you know you have you've influenced tons of people and i think and, and think and all the good stuff you've done do you think that you know, after the trouble happened, people sometimes forget, you know, they forget about what all your clients have done, and they just focus on this little part of your life. It, it has been that way for three or four years. Um, when it was revealed I had problems with alcohol, I was feeling like, who am I, President Obama? <laughs> uh, why would this run on the news all around the world? When I declared for bankruptcy... There were people knocking at my front door from local news. You should and, charge them to get in. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, because I didn't answer to the door, they posted a headline, which was, Jerry Maguire is missing. Jerry <laughs> Maguire runs for the border. So here's the thing, though. If you want to make a public impact, then you have to live with the fact that people will have opinions and the rest of it. But I've described my story so many times now it's hard to get a real sense of enthusiasm right. <laughs> when you tell it the the 500th time and the difficulty is i don't see myself as someone who's complete in returning from addiction i'm a bun in the oven still <laughs> getting ready to rise um and that's that quote's going up tomorrow on facebook <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag, yeah. <laughs> but all those years when I was struggling with alcohol and I would go into rehab or I'd, I'd put some spry together and I'd say, this time I have it, this time I know, this time I'm, and, and this uh, last time, 
all I've said is my days because I got nothing else to say <laughs> about my sobriety other than than uh, I went to uh, to a unique fellowship. Um, I, <laughs> it is definitely very unique, that fellowship. Yeah. <laughs> I got a home group. Yeah. I worked at 12 Steps. I got a sponsor. I had a sponsor. Um, and uh, uh, I surrendered. I found a higher power, and I've tried to be of service to other uh, people who are struggling. See, I have a conspiracy, the end, conspiracy theory, Andrew. I think you have that more people, than one, but let's hear the many, latest. Okay. But I think people are unforgiving because they, assu- they associate him with Tom Cruise. <laughs> now, they can't go after Tom Cruise because Tom Cruise is Jerry Maguire, so they go after the real Jerry Maguire. Just a thought. Another Judaism it's for the stretch. book. It's a stretch. It's, yeah. Well, <laughs> we chose to launch uh, this year uh, and to advertise the fact that we were back in business. Lee Steinberg Sports. Sports and yeah. Entertainment. And Which, by the way, congratulations on yeah. getting your license back. Thank you. I'm certified to represent NFL players, NBA players. I can do a Major League Baseball player. Maybe actors, because we have a couple in the room that is are that watching your goal? the show. I mean, what's the goal with the new company? Well, the goal is to represent high quality athletes in major sports to mm-hmm. to and then to use that to power a marketing arm which can market teams, leagues, any um, corporation and any high profile individual and then we've moved towards content supply with not a studio not in the four wall brick and mortar sense but in the virtual sense it's a sports theme motion pictures so I've got a new uh, we're a rich source of that. Television shows, I signed to do a reality show called uh, So You Want to Be a Super Sports Agent. Um, I've got a movie that I'm a producer on, and they want me to uh, be the narrator, too. To which I said, can't you find someone with those deep, mellifluous tones? <laughs> I mean, they have I, auto-tune. We'll, yeah, we'll work on it. <laughs> I, I need a James Earl Jones implant. Uh, but anyway... That could then, go a lot of ways there. I don't know if we want to touch that one. Con- so. <laughs> concussion is uh, another thing which I've been fighting on for years and years and years. And I now believe that every time an offensive lineman hits a defensive lineman at the inception of a football play, it produces a low-level concussive hit each time. So an offensive lineman who had played in high school, college, and professional football could exit the game with 10,000 sub-concussive hits, none of which have been diagnosed, none of which uh, have been, he's been aware of. Or they've been covered up by medications and pain pills. Well, the aggregate of that is is substantially worse than three knockout blows. Yeah. So I've called it a ticking time bomb and an undiagnosed health epidemic, and I had a crisis of conscience. I really couldn't represent players anymore, knowing I was sending them out to potentially get dementia without fighting on this issue. So what's your solution? We urgently need to tell young kids not to block with the head and neck and teach them from when they're young. Then we need a helmet that does more than the current ones, which protect against skull fracture. Right. So I'm working with a project that attenuates the energy force that comes currently, hits the plastic, hits the liner, and goes right into a player's head, which I think is very promising. It's a different approach. Mm. Then we need better devices on the sideline to diagnose the not-so-obvious hits um, quickly so we don't put the person back into return to play. And lastly, we need nutraceutical and pharmaceutical uh, solutions that either prophylactically protect the brain prior or at the time of. And the magic pill that everybody's fighting for is something that will actually heal the brain. Mm -hmm. The problem with this issue is the brain's the last frontier of medical research. So we've uh, discovered virtually 80% of what we know about the brain in the last 10 years. And if you just tuned in, you're always listening to Clean Radio. This is We're in studio tonight with Lee Steinberg, so give us a call. The number is 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. Um, so, you know, when Jerry Maguire came out, people had obviously heard of you, you know, and, but not on that level. Did that harm or did that, How? I mean, what effect did it have? It had a dynamic effect because... Um, 
we were, we did I helped do publicity for for the film and and at Cameron Crowe people saw him following me around right. I mean he went to the NFL draft in 1993 he went up to the Bill Parcells press conference he came to the league meetings I mean we were running into millions of people came to games um, and uh, so I couldn't go through an airport or anywhere without someone saying to me or asking me to say back to them... Show me the money. Those four words. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know... But you should just tape it and then just play the tape recorder. Well, it, look, when you, when you go out in public, you need to be gracious and nice to right. people. And... Um, but it was an interesting experience. I had to vet the script to make sure that the willing suspension of disbelief that's necessary to hold you into a motion picture didn't get abused. Um, and uh, they descended on my office. They took uh, pictures of me, and Jerry Maguire's head was put onto my body, uh, <laughs> pictures out the window. And we went. I took Cuba Gooding Jr. down to Phoenix and made him pretend he was a wide receiver at that Super Bowl for a week. And um, I actually had to show the quarterback, Jerry O'Connell, how to throw a football because he'd gone to NYU and they didn't have a football And he program. was the fat kid in Goonies. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> so Jerry Maguire, were you drinking at that point a lot? What was, what was going on? Had it gotten? Uh, no. My evolution in alcohol, which gets clearer and clearer to me with each year yeah. because memory is not a photograph of events as they actually occur. It's ephemeral. And what happens is you tell yourself a story or you tell other people about something that happened, and eventually that's what you believe happened. And you can pass a lie detector test, asked, uh, ask O.J. Simpson. <laughs> so the point is that uh, I started out, uh, I grew up in a Jewish family. There's no alcohol in the house. I don't ever recall my dad or mom drinking. Um, I made it all the way to college without drinking. And then I was one beer Steinberg. I mean, I would feel, <laughs> I would feel a little bit... Um, when women would go out with you, they, they know that was the trick to get Lee. Um, one, one beer. beer. <laughs> well, as long as it was only... I never went there. Clean radio. Yeah. <laughs> clean, <laughs> it's clean radio. It's clean right. radio, right. <laughs> so as time went on, I was in the Disneyland of drinking. I mean, our field was... Uh, now, when I was at Berkeley, there were other substances I might have liked a little better. And I think if I'd continued to use them, I'm not sure that I ever would have gotten into alcoholism. But there you was, got, yeah, That's a good question, though. Would you have gotten into addiction? Or That's probably all somewhat yeah. cumulative. I mean. You know, I, I, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I don't recall jonesing for marijuana. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, I, I remember being paranoid, but we got to go to break. <laughs> and if you just tuned in, you're listening to Clean Radio. We're in the studio tonight with uh, Lee Steinberg. His website is SteinbergSports.com, Facebook.com slash Super Agent Lee Steinberg, or Twitter him at, at SteinbergSports.com. I want to ask you some questions. We got lined up. We got calls lined up at the break. The discussion continues at cleanradio.com. Are you or someone you care about addicted to drugs or alcohol? Addiction ruins lives and destroys families. Bring an end to the pain and suffering by calling Clean Treatment Centers. Clean has helped people from around the world break free by not only treating the addiction, but the underlying causes and providing vital aftercare so people can get clean and stay clean with no gimmicks and no false promises. If you need immediate assistance or just have questions, call Clean Treatment Centers for guidance. A much better life awaits. Welcome back to Clean Radio. Addiction happens. Recovery and a new life starts here. here. Watch the worldwide live video stream and get immediate addiction assistance at cleanradio.com. That's clean with a K. Now back to Andrew Spanswick and Judah Friedman. You can do better than that, Jerry. I want you to say it with you with me then, brother. Hey, I got Bob Sugar on the other line. I better hear you say it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Show you the money. Not, not show you. Show me the money. Show me the money. Yeah. Show me the money. That's it, brother, but you got to go. I love when Steve uh, back there, he, he just he tuned just, in. He, he's so happy right now. He's, just, he's an engineer that yeah. just gets to Yeah, and do he does anything. a great job. So thank you, Steve. And welcome, everybody, back to Clean Radio. Um, one of the things I actually really want to talk about when Lee gets back here in a second, he got a phone call. But one of the things I want to talk about is um, 
Andrew is losing, you know, when people are getting sober, you know, or when people are drinking, they start losing a lot. And a lot of our callers out there, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our fans out there have lost a lot. You know, we get texts all the time. We get Facebook posts all the time from people that are just. And a lot of that makes it worse. When you start losing everything, you're like, oh, it just makes you more depressed and start covering up more pain. So. And the you know and the question is a lot of times when people are going through that struggle and their families going through the struggle of sobriety before you get sober, you know it's hard to see your way out and it's it, it takes sometimes you know it's hard you know you go through bankruptcy you know and I'm, I'm you know not to bring up Andrew a personal topic but I am yeah I did go bankrupt in yeah. 2000 after having all my companies crash in the stock market so join the club it was pretty yeah <laughs> <laughs> and Lee, and Lee made his it was not it was not a fun year uh, <laughs> April. Uh, 18th, 2000, or and it really, less. And, and it <laughs> sticks with you. It really sticks with you. It's uh, well, it's hard to, you know, for me, it was it was weird because uh, I had made a lot of money very quickly, very young, and uh, you know, I didn't really, I thought like everything I touched would turn to gold, and then it was the internet era, so all of a sudden it was like, oh, you know, hell, why not just start a 70 million dollar internet company, and you know, and then when it all goes upside down in literally three and a half weeks, and you owe three and a half million dollars on top of what you lost. You're like, oh, you know, I, asked you, to stop, I asked you to stop telling people my story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. And least I was in. But, but hold on. I'm going to ask Lee, like, you know, you've lost a lot of money. And, you know, people always ask me, like, how do you lose so much money? Or how could you ever not have put away $20 million and not have to worry about it? But for me, like, I know for me, it was part of the game. It was, you know, playing with money and it was growing it. And you're you're all in. At least I was at that time all the time. You know, well, how well, was the, it for you? Like, the problem is that. When we sold our company for $120 million, my partner and I, people knew. Or when we sold an internet, uh, our share of an internet company for $25 million or whatever. And people could do the math. So I faced continuously the question, how did you waste $100 million? But I will tell you this. When I finally got to the point where I was so far in debt that um, I felt like Sisyphus pushing the ball up the hill, that there would never be light at the end of that tunnel. Um, It gives you a real appreciation, not that I was ever arrogant, but for what it's like to live without money. And when you have money, you never think about it. When you don't have money, it's all you think about. And uh, And especially when you're getting sober, you know, when you're getting sober and just everything is... Everything is gone, and you have to, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're dealing with a bottom that's not just spiritual, that's not just you know, emotional, but it's also financial. It's also credibility. Like it's yeah. amazing. I mean, you know, I talk to people that work for me now, and I would tell them what I had done before I started this latest company, and none of them believed anything about my past. Right. Like they'd all be like, "Oh, you know." Well, like, it's, <laughs> you know? it's the same way. And when then you, they find out, and then they're like, "Oh, it really was true." Like <laughs> sort of the same way when you go to meetings. Um, but when I was at the point where they said sober living was going to serve meals, but they didn't. Um, and, uh, and some very interesting gentlemen came and took my car away in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> and didn't explain themselves. They, they just put it up and, and they took it. And, you know, it never came back. Anyway, so when I was eating candy bars at, at Charlie Street, First Step Recovery in Costa Mesa to eat, um, you do get that sense because the lack of money leads to a whole cascade of consequences right. uh, where everything becomes uh, difficult. Now, money was never my goal. It was to try to have impact and make a difference. Uh, it was odd that it would have come. But back to your other question, um, my drinking came on strong later in life. And... Um, I I had actually never, virtually never drank during the day, but when I got divorced and I was in an apartment, I found out there was a stunning revelation that it's actually legal to consume alcohol while the sun's up outside, (laughs) and that was a slippery slope for me because it it was the ability, because getting an alcohol level up to a point where... um, it was uh, dangerous, um, it was possible. I think most alcoholics, actually, that is like that w- that moment of awareness where all of a sudden you realize you can actually drink first thing in the morning. And it's freedom. It's bliss. Yeah, it's like, it's <laughs> absolute bliss. You don't have to wait around you, until you're set time. N- nobody's nagging you. Know? you. 
You yeah. know, you have you have some money that, you know, I, my first sponsor would often share about that. You know, his wife kicked him out of the house. He got a studio apartment in Manhattan. And he goes, and I was free to smoke as much crack as possible. <laughs> and and he had, and, and to him, watching, and, and that lasted two weeks. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. So I had friends, and they would come to my apartment. I had lady friends that would come to my apartment. They would take away my keys uh, when I still had a car. They took away my wallet. They took everything away. So I would walk down to to the uh, pavilions and explain to them that I had left my wallet up in my apartment, and uh, if if I could have that jug size vodka <laughs> bottle, uh, the vodka bottle that ate Los Angeles, <laughs> then. Um, uh, I would certainly bring the money back very quickly, and I could do that at a 7-Eleven, too. So there are times when your own cleverness and ability to persuade uh, works against you. And by the way, if you just tuned in, you're listening to Clean Radio. That's Lee Steinberg. A um, couple questions I want to ask, Andrew, and I, we all go through this. You get sober, and you know, you know, eventually you want to start dating, let's say, and you're constantly asked that question, you know, and you know they're thinking it. Is he safe to date? You know, he was an alcoholic. He made a mess of his life. Can I trust him? And this is something a lot of people, when they're new, when they're, when they're five years sober, when they're 10 years sober, you say that thing. And it's the same thing with financing, you know, fi finances. Finance, yeah. You know, it's like, look at what he did. You know, Andrew, you went bankrupt. How could I trust him? And uh, obviously, you've done an amazing job. And I'm talking about this to Lee, too. It's, it's, and at a certain point, you know, you got to, if you're a person, you got to have faith that that person you're going to jump in bed with is, you know, going to make it. Well, I did, I did not get into a intimate relationship the first three years. And uh, it was partly because I didn't think it was conscionable um, to get in a relationship where prospectively someone might really care and then relapse. And the other thing is that it's... Uh, Although I had been through the whole world of banquets and the rest of it uh, in sobriety, it's quite another thing to, uh, I realized at a certain point that it had been so long since uh, I hadn't had alcohol before engaging in intimacy <laughs> that it was like a, I had to relearn um, how, to, how to socialize. N not in my business life, I could still go to banquets and do the rest of it, to socialize with a woman without it yeah there's a lot of anxiety that comes up and a lot of you know a lot of the reasons that alcohol is so effective is a social lubricant yeah. it gets rid of that anxiety and that fear and then when you actually have to face those things head on again especially in older age when you're supposed to already have mastered these kind of things right and then you're like oh maybe i actually don't know well, how to handle it, this because it's crazy <laughs> you know it's like i always say it's like the movie big you right. know and big all he wants to do is be an adult and then he's granted that but at the end of the movie he gets to be a kid again you know, you get sober, you're 40, you're 20, and all of a sudden... Well, you, I wish I was uh, 20 or 40. But you don't get a chance to be that little kid. You know, you're, 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 it's almost like learning on, you know, yeah. learning... As I was 61 years old, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it's... It was, I need to meet your urologist. I, I, I had a very, uh, I had a, a very scary moment. Um, when you turn this age... There's a whole series of people who are paid by the federal government to explain Medicare to you. Right. And so I start getting <laughs> these things saying, now in March, you're going to turn 65, and we'll talk you. I didn't even want the Medicare for me to 65, you know. It reminds me of the first time I was a senior at a movie. And um, my kids took me for the. I said, I don't want that discount. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> copping to it. You didn't go to Olive Garden after. <laughs> exactly. I'll pay the extra two bucks. But here's, just the, here's my question too. So what do you say to people? You're back. Lee Steinberg is back. You have your company back. And I just want to say very quickly, you didn't lose your licensing because of anything. It lapsed. And I think that's an important thing to make. You know, to let people know sometimes is because you were just drinking. You didn't. You know. You didn't. Right. Nor did I ever lose my bar license, right. uh, or um, it, it, that was not the. I didn't go into the office and function with alcohol in my system. As a matter of fact, I would I would have uh, I never associated it that way. It would have um, seriously traumatized me to have to be 
uh, drinking or or impaired and do that. I didn't do that. I just didn't go in, you know, a, a day, a week, or a day or two every two weeks. And uh, but you lose the reliability factor. Right. All right. So let's answer a couple of questions. Let's get this like let's get it out of the way because I'm sure right now people come to your office and they they obviously they they know the story and they're thinking certain things. So. Let's get to the money. So, you know, you, 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 you're bad with your own money, not with your players' money. Right. And, you know, your players, get, get, like we said, $600 million and uh, over and, billions. And, and they've been big successes big in success. second career. And good people. You right. know, Troy Aikman, you know, you have, you know, Warren Moon, you took this guy out of the CFL and you got him the, one of the biggest contracts ever. So what you've done, you've done it for your clients. Yes. It's, um, uh, and in second career, yeah. I mean, Steve Young and Brent Jones have, Steve Young sold an internet company, has a, a, a big uh, hedge fund, so does Brent Jones. A couple of players are, are minority owners of NFL teams um, in broadcast. It's Troy Aikman and Desmond Howard and Greg Anthony and Daryl Johnson and Steve Young and on and on and on. So I carefully prepared them for a uh, second career. And the truth of the matter is, look, I went out and gave a speech a week uh, for the last 40 years. I've spoken on 76 uh, college campuses. Wow. And there are large numbers of people out there who, who I've tried to mentor or to um, stimulate to refute situational ethics and to know you can be a decent person and still flourish in this society. Um, so... Uh, they didn't all go away. I went away. Right. I withdrew. And it uh, wasn't like people were uh, deserting me. They were somewhat oblivious to what was happening. Well, you know, I think also there's a myth about alcoholics and uh, drug addicts as somehow um, being people that don't care. And I tend to see most of the people that we treat and that come into the show um, and speak about what's happening to them, they all tend to have one thing in common, and that's that they all are, like, deeply sensitive they're actually overly sensitive. They care often. too much. Yeah, they care too much. And they all have these ideas. And I think that, you know, life can be painful when you're facing a society that really is pretty aggressive and nasty a lot of the time, you know? Well, uh, he, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sort of used to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're an agent. So. Uh, it, uh, I'm sort of used to it. It's yeah. it's tough in the, in the sports world. It's... Um, and you make a choice to put yourself out there. At the same time, I'm going to go speak or or have a story done by 60 Minutes or a number of different public things. I want that so that I have a forum to try to make a difference in. Right. Um, but, but it is a lot to take on that responsibility. You know, you, and, and I think that, you know, part of addiction and drinking covers a lot of, like, taking all that on and really having nowhere to go for it except for the rewards that you're creating for yourself, which you, then you don't want to sort of accept because you feel like you did it out of humility to begin with. I agree. It's, it's hard to give. I find most people that are successful and alcoholic have a hard time giving themselves credit for anything. Well, that's true. Um, for 40 years, we just went on to the next event, on to the next event. Uh, more sports movies, uh, write a best-selling book, save the San Francisco Giants, uh, set up more charitable programs. Uh, uh, you know, Who's I had, next? I had 60 first-round draft picks uh, in the NFL. Oh. I, I represented the first player in the draft eight separate years. Um, I have seven players in the Hall of Fame. Um, there were weekends I had half the starting quarterbacks. And we had a huge baseball practice and basketball and boxing. I did the largest boxing contract ever, which was Lennox Lewis and uh, Mike Tyson. Um. And <laughs> so the point was that there's one way in which I'm happy that this happened because it gave me a chance later in life to actually examine whatever my spiritual beliefs were um, and the best way to use the time I had remaining, I think, had this not happened, I'd have just run straight through. There was so much frenetic activity in my life, and I have three kids. And so uh, midlife crisis never hit me. I just went by because we still, my youngest daughter is 18. And so this did give me a break, although I wouldn't have 
plotted it out this way uh, to to try and and focus on a, a a better, more productive use of the time I'd have remaining. You're listening to Clean Radio. That's Lee Steinberg. Give us a call, 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. Um, Lee Steinberg as in, you know, obviously you've become now, you've become known now as Jerry Maguire. And um, in a sense, you know, but one of the things I want to ask you about, um, see, so you get a lot of questions now, I'm sure. You get, you know, families coming in. You get all these different types of questions. And it was one of the reasons I asked that question before. How, you know, you're managing their money. You're managing, you know, you're sober. How, in, in, there is no guarantee, right, Andrew, that somebody's going to stay sober. And I think that when they're talking to somebody that's sober, that, that you know, that's a fear of theirs. How do we... It's absolutely a fear. And the only responsible respo- response is, the only honest response is, um, that I'm sober today, and based on my spiritual uh, condition, um, I've got a chance to be sober tomorrow. And that's really all I can say, other than describing the fact that I've got a support system in effect, and I work hard at it. The way I sort of looked at it was that if it took a couple hours a day, like a meeting and and some reading and, and, and the rest of it, to free myself up for the 22 other hours of the day, that it was a good trade. And it was certainly better than... It was a good negotiation. And, and, and given the amount of time that... I spent drinking, which was mostly late at night. It was a, a very good trade, but but I'm going through the process of recruiting um, young college players who will uh, be part of the 2014 football draft. And <laughs> so quickly, one question, quickly: What do you say to people that say maybe he's past his prime? Because I think that's a cr- I mean, you know what happened to in, in our society? When I go to a hospital, I want to go to the doctor that's done it all. You know, it's uh, you know, I want to go to the doctor that's seen that, seen it, been there, could give me the greatest advice. I was so bored at times in the last three or four years <laughs> that I'm filled with energy, and um, I think the whole concept of age is different. And it's the same owners that were my friends. Uh, it's the same people yeah. in sports that were my friends. That's the great thing about sports. The owners always stay the same, <laughs> or as their kids. And they've <laughs> welcomed me back. Yeah. And, again, none of them went away. Um, so I have better relationships with owners than anybody ever has who's done what I do because I didn't see this as a labor versus management uh, problem. So those are all tough questions. Now, if you go to um, try and entice a young man and his family to for representation i don't have a divine right to represent him i've right. got to be open to any questions uh, that they ask and um i suppose at some point you just have to take a leap of faith that um we're on the right track and who better to go with you know with a leap of faith so the, the one of the, my favorite quotes from jerry Maguire was break down or break through and um was that you or was that cameron Whatever happened, well, I'll keep it between Cameron and me. <laughs> because it does. It's it's it, getting sober is is one of those things, Andrew. It feels like that. You're not sure if it's a breakdown. You know, when you when you when you're nearly sober, because it really does feel like that. As you stay sober, you realize it was a breakthrough. Let's go to Amy. She's been waiting. Uh, let's go to Amy in Vancouver. Welcome to Clean Radio, Amy. Back. Hi. Hi. How are you? You. I'm doing. I'm doing fine. Um. Uh, earlier. Uh, he mentioned uh, something That's Lee. about yeah. Lee. Right. Yes. Hi. I heard hi, you Amy. say something about hi. Um, you were you had mentioned something about um, head injury um, issues, and I, I I grew up in a football town, and my brothers both uh, played football. And my advice is don't put the gear on, <laughs> keep it in the locker, and don't play football. <laughs> Well, I will tell you, if if 30% of the mothers in this country agree with you, and if they really know what's happening, unless we reform this, it's an existential threat to football because it won't be like football dies, but if people like you tell your kids you can play any sport except tackle football, 
then the socioeconomics of football will change. It will be you know, it's funny. Se- my parents wouldn't let me play football. Yeah. They'd only let me play hockey. Well, both my sons I- did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great choice. I let my son skateboard, but I don't let him play football. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm yeah. not really sure about the safety. Uh, <laughs> uh, you might want to do but, some no. statistical studies on skateboarding. But you would get to a point where the same people who still engage in boxing, knowing it's pretty clear that there's brain damage that yeah. uh, occurs, uh, because they're trying to escape a certain socioeconomic uh, prison, right. they'll be the only ones playing it. I mean, the numbers are actually staggering uh, about how poorly uh, your or how poor your chances are of really ever getting anything out of football, right? I mean, there's a million kids every year go out for football in high school. Well, but it does. Right? It teaches uh, a variety of life skills that I still think are important. It teaches mm-hmm. self-discipline, self-respect working in a team unit, processing large amounts of information, and elevating one's level of play amidst crisis. So a lot of that's transferable to, uh, to business and other parts of life. Amy, um, does that help at all? Yeah, but one of the other comments that I wanted to make was um, when, when he mentioned about how he went into the office um, later, you know, waited a week sometimes because of the alcohol. Um, um, I don't want to go into all the details, but um, what he doesn't know, I've been in a domestic violence situation, and I used wine for a coping method through my my, uh, situation. And um, what my dilemma was, it was kind of similar to what you did as far as not going in the office. Um, I just didn't go to the programs that I was supposed to be going to because the people that were at those programs um, didn't believe that the abuse was happening. And so I was kind of relating um, in some sense because I was home having a glass of wine. I understand. Um, that's a real problem with domestic violence. Um, my daughter and I actually chaired a luncheon which was men against domestic violence because the definition definition of it as a women's issue has always staggered me. Um, I have a a daughter, I have a mother, I have an aunt, I have all sorts of people in my life uh, and part of my job is to protect them. So it's as much my issue as as anybody else's but good luck to you. Amy thanks a lot and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Amy in Vancouver, Washington. If you just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. We're in the, we're in the studio tonight with uh, Super Sports Agent. I'm having a problem with my S's. Sibylon um, S's. Sibylon. Lisa, <laughs> Lisa, Lisa Steinberg. And, and you're back. You got the licensing back. You're ready to go. And, Lisa, and Steinberg Sports is... We're holding our Super Bowl party in New York. Um, which That's is... going to be cold. Yeah, because <laughs> that's in, where the Super Bowl is. Yeah. Not, not inside. Not inside, right? Not inside. There'll be 5,000 of my closest friends. Uh, <laughs> but we've been able to use that. Um, uh, I'm going to have a, a big screen uplink between the party and troops in the field in Afghanistan. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's so cool. So the, the, and we're going to have a bank of phones so you can talk to a wounded soldier. Um, we've been able to do some fun things uh, in Miami. Uh, we actually sent a water machine that could purify water for 140,000 people. Uh, we shipped it off to cholera, torn uh, Haiti after the earthquake. So, so if you're but if you're a parent out there, and you're you know we have a lot of parents out there, and we have parents that their sons play athletics, and if you're if if their if your kid is you know going to their first agent to meet him and interviewing him, I can't think of a better response than. I want to take care of your son. I want your son to do well. I want your son to also make money, but I want him to have a future. And also to protect his health. Yeah. Because all the athletes are in denial. They think they'll, uh, the long term health's an abstraction. And so it's the mother, father, wife that are my best allies because the athletes won't protect themselves. And to anybody curious out there if Lee still got it, everybody, I just want to know, I told people about the show and people just, People wanted to come. People wanted to meet you. In our audience tonight, we have Marge and uh, Larry, Margaret and Larry. I just wanted to start calling you guys Marge and Larry. I don't know why. Mag, Madge, I mean. And um, <laughs> and we got Scott Krinsky, who is on the show. Chuck in the background. And you're on the show. Newsroom. And you still have, I mean, these people, you, you influenced a generation. I don't see why you can't influence the next generation, because in your case, it's about love. It's about commitment. And that's really the, the connecting theme throughout time. 
That's why I keep speaking at campuses yeah. to to inspire that next generation. Um, dream the way you want the world to be and work to make that happen. And, I mean, there was one last question I want to ask you about Jerry Maguire. Was that the, There was the story with the hockey player in there. And it sounds a lot like, I'm not going to ask you who gave the idea, since I will let that be between <laughs> you and Cameron. But it just sounds like that was, you know, with, with the hockey player that you didn't want him to, you know, that, you know, he was going through all the concussions. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you do need the ambassador of Quan, your agent of Quan, which is you caring. You know, and I don't think enough agents do care. And I don't know agents enough, but I... Well, what they feel is this is about the economics. So take all my social engineering and and throw it out. Um, But I believe traditional agentry is done wrong because it emphasizes only the economic part of it. Uh, When your real job is to be partially a teacher, partially a mentor, partially a coach, an inspiration to help people live... Uh, healthy lives and uh, and make an impact on the world uh, because that role modeling aspect can be take bullying um, in the socioeconomics of a high school it's the athletes or the social structure who are the the biggest uh, stars um, if they start speaking out about tolerance you can change the dynamic in that in that high school. You can make it uncool to to haze and harass and bully people. And we're running out of time, and um, hopefully we'll have you back on when your new book comes out. Uh, what's it called again? The Agent? Yeah, it's very creative. Uh, yeah. The Agent. <laughs> the, uh, so even and I it's can not remember a spy that. thriller. <laughs> you, you um, yeah, I don't, have, right. I don't have a license to kill. You don't claim, I, you, don't claim you work for the CIA no, as well? I don't have a license to kill. I have a license to talk. <laughs> and, and, um, but Andrew, one of the really, and Lee, you know, one of the things, and I don't often talk about uh, what, it, what the good things that Andrew does, because you guys are very aligned like that. Andrew probably gives away about 20% of the beds almost and, you know, a clean treatment center because he's not just about making money. He's about helping people out there. And a lot of people don't know this. And the clients the other day were talking to me. And um, one of the things they were talking about was, you know, the kindness that this man does. And I think it's important sometimes to acknowledge guys like you. Good for Andrew. Who, and good for you because it's people like you, Lee Steinberg, that, you know, parents could feel safe again that parents could know that their kids are safe, that you're not going to take advantage of them. Hey, thanks for coming on, Lee. It was great to have you back. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And uh, if you just tuned in again, you're listening to Lee. You're listening to Clean Radio, and that was Lee Steinberg. I want to thank everybody out there, all our fans, Steve behind the board and Rand, and everybody. Discussion continues at Clean Radio. Are you or someone you care about addicted to drugs or alcohol? Addiction ruins lives and destroys families. Bring an end to the pain and suffering by calling Clean Treatment Centers. Clean has helped people from around the world break free by not only treating the addiction, but the underlying causes and providing vital aftercare so people can get clean and stay clean with no gimmicks and no false promises. If you need immediate assistance or just have questions, call Clean Treatment Centers for guidance. A much better life awaits. 